Coming up on DMT, I chat to the CEO of SASEM, Hall of Fame songwriter Paul Williams, Peer Music's CEO, I cover the global repertoire database and BitTorrent. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, episode 135, recorded between the 3rd and the 6th of June 2013. If you're watching the video, you'll notice a lovely alternative intro that I recorded outside the Library of Congress in Washington DC yesterday, but the audio for it was pretty much unusable, so I had to re-record it here in London. So this week I was in Washington recording interviews at the World Creators Summit, which had been organized by CSAC, the International Federation for Authors and Composers Societies, which gathered speakers from all over the world talking about author rights, policy, copyright, keeping the creators firmly in focus. So a very interesting crowd that is different from the conferences that I've covered in the past and I hope that will come through in the series of interviews I've lined up for you today and I hope you will find them interesting. So uh, again uh, this week after last week's Asia special it's a slightly unconventional episode where I line up five of the interviews uh, that I recorded at the summit and you will find the other 15 on digitalmusictrends.com probably from the middle of next week. Also watch out for next week's edition of Digital Music Trends where we get back to the news and it promises to be a very interesting show if Apple delivers on the rumors that have been floating around in the past few days and launches iRadio. Uh, this week we start with uh, Jean-Noël Tron, uh, the CEO of SASEM, uh, the French Collection Society. Then I speak to Paul Williams, the president of ASCAP and very well-known songwriter. And for those of you who don't know him, you should go and check out track 7 and 9 of the new Daft Punk album because he's uh, collaborated with them on that. Uh, then uh, I talk to uh, Ralph Pierre, the CEO of Pierre Music. Uh, I also hosted a conversation with YouTube and the Danish Songwriters Guild uh, on the Global Repertoire Database. And uh, finally, I talked to Matt Mason from BitTorrent. Uh, I really hope you enjoy the show. Have a great week. And until next time. So it's a real pleasure to uh, here at the World Creators Summit uh, to be here with uh, Jean-Noël uh, Tron, uh, the CEO of uh, SASEM. So hi, Jean-Noël, and thanks for joining me on the show. How's it going today? Hi, thank you very much. Uh, just great. You know, the weather is nice in D.C. And we are just with friends and family from the from the not only in the music industry but you know every creators in the world because CISAC represents more than three million creators and it's a it's a unique worldwide organization that we need to build on. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a very interesting organization and, and one that people should know more about, uh, I think. And uh, so let's start uh, talking about the. You know, the, one of the big news of SASM in the last uh, couple of months, uh, which is the fact that you reached a deal with YouTube. And so I wanted to ask you uh, right off the bat, you know, are you happy with, uh, with what uh, came out of that? And uh, uh, what, what benefits do you think will bring to, to SASM members? Well, yes, we are very happy. Uh, by the way, over the last 10 years, we have signed uh, hundreds of uh, licenses with uh, online services, whether it's about streaming or about downloading. Um, and we are here to give access to our repertoire. This is what our members want. So you're right, we just signed two very important deals, one uh, with YouTube, the other one with the mother company, with Google, who's, yeah. as you know, just about to launch some new very important uh, product and services for their customers, because Android is, and soon will be in about a billion devices in the world, so that's key. Um, it's true that in some ways it has been described as a, a historical agreement for uh, for a society because it covers more than 120 countries in the world. Uh, it's not only a deal for all the SASM repertoire, and you know we represent more than 100 and 400,000 creators in the world, but it's also a deal we made for our partners of Universal Music Publishing International and for all their Anglo-Saxon repertoire that's covered by the deal too. The benefits for our members is very simple. It's to give them a better share of the value created by YouTube thanks to the advertising revenues that YouTube derives from having music videos on its uh, on its websites yeah sure absolutely and so uh, talking about uh, the importance of digital for SASM, uh, i was very uh, struck this morning by your remark that uh, you know the the digital uh, revenues of SASM, uh, actually m most of those are not derived from online services but from other areas. So can you elaborate a little bit as to uh, what constitutes uh, digital revenues for SASM right now? Sure. 
it is true that in Europe we have some um, way of creating value that does not exist, for example, in the US. Um, one is what we call private copy levy, which is a very, very good example of how copyright, how the right of authors, has been always on the move. Uh, at the beginning of the 1980s in Europe, following the German example, Europe adopted almost everywhere, the only exception being, I guess, UK and maybe Ireland, a provision in which they created an exception to copyright. Anyone can copy at home on any device. At that time, it was analog, like videotape. And today, it's any digital device, like, you know, your tablet or your mobile phone, but can be also your USB drive. And those industrials who manufacture these devices and who get enormous benefits from the possibility offered to the consumer to copy, they have to contribute to the creator's industry. Altogether, this account for about 70 million US dollars for the same revenues. On the French market, altogether, this private copy levy account for about 200 million euros, so roughly, I would say, 240 million USD, yeah. which is less than, you know, 2% of the revenue of this industry. So it's really harmless against what, of the, what some of them are trying to say. The second stream of digital revenues knowing that the question is where does this revenue come? This is what we call them digital revenues because these are digital players, of course. So the second stream comes from the internet service providers. Why? Because in Europe and especially in France, um, in France the cable industry is weak and uh, almost 40% of the households get TV through IPTV provided on an ADSL line. Yeah. And so these ISPs have, of course, to contribute through author's rights, so copyright revenues, and this account for roughly um, 50 million USD. So this accounts for 80% of our digital revenues. And then we have, of course, the online revenues coming from every kind of services, from Deezer. Spotify to Deezer, from iTunes to YouTube. And this represents roughly um, 27 million USD. It's, of course, growing fast, but it yeah. is less than the 20% of the total, yeah. knowing that altogether digital revenues represents around 14, 14% of our revenues at the same. Yeah. yeah, sure. And looking at, uh, you know, at Medium, you were talking about uh, how collective management systems are for you, uh, you know, the most effective way forward for creators. And because, of course, of the, the huge amount of power required to elaborate all the data and, and create the reports and, and, and you know, make, make sense of everything that comes mm -hmm. back to you through uh, both digital and analog services. So uh, uh, how important is it for uh, the European societies to uh, be able to uh, negotiate as, as one entity, for example, SASEM retains all, all the rights around uh, uh, that particular license that you, that, you, that you issue and how important is it uh, for this setup to be like that as opposed to perhaps the US where uh, publishers can decide to take away the digital rights or do different things? Well, uh, everyone has to remember that at the core of this phenomenal model of collective management because we are a collective society. We are a known for profit organization. We are run by our members. Yeah. I'm elected by a group of authors and songwriters and publishers. Um, at the origin of it was a very simple idea that when you are an author or a songwriter, how successful that you can be if you are alone, you're weak, you know, that's exactly like in any other kind of business, whereas something is collective, you know. You're a farmer, you have making milk. If you want distribution or, you know, big uh, manufacturers of yogurts to offer you some kind of fair price for your products, you would better regroup with your fellow farmer's neighbors. Yeah. And that's the model of every collecting society. The rules has to be in solidarity between the members. And as you know, all over Europe, we have something called exclusive assignment, which is that as a creator, 
As a publisher, you can perfectly choose to manage your right yourself. No one is obliged to be a member of the society. And if you want to join a society, you can do it wherever you want. Some French important composers are members of other societies. And at SACEM, we are very proud, I must say, to have about 17,000 members that are non-French for 160 countries in the world. But at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is, is a society able to simplify the life of music users? Yeah. And what music users ask is to be sure that they can negotiate for the biggest repertoire that they can have access to. Yeah. And this is definitely the virtues of the model. Yeah. Def definitely this is what uh, differentiates possibly the, the European market and many other markets in the world from some other markets that what, what's happening uh, in the US. And I think it's a really tough time for creators. Yeah. And I was in, in, impressed today by so your rebuttal of uh, some uh, perhaps uh, sweeping generalizations that, that do happen uh, quite often in this industry, talking about sort of uh, how perhaps uh, uh, societies or other members of the music industry are stuck in the past and how they need to embrace uh, technology and you know very sweeping generalizations on, on, on how the industry is not moving forward but of course you you, you you come from a business background in in technology and so of course you 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 don't stand for that and, and you want to make sure that people know that as a society you are a forward-thinking organization right <laughs> Well, yes, I think we all try to do, and all my colleagues from all societies are doing the same. So, no, what I'm impressed, you know, I've been in this industry, I mean, the music industry for only a year, and something that really surprised me is how this industry is underestimated itself. Yeah. You know, the music industry tends to think that they have to apologize for something. But mm -hmm. gosh, when it comes to the digital revolution, and as you said, I started my career working for the computer industry. Then I moved into the information system industry and then I work to develop the internet in France for five years. And, and, and then I've spent five years with a major telco. Uh, I was even the CEO of the mobile operations of this telco in France. Um, I'm impressed by the fact that on all cultural industries and content industries, the music industry is the first one which really embraced the digital revolution. Everyone from, you know, authors and songwriters to major publishers or labels are today fully thinking in terms of being digital. So this is also the reason why I'm so straightforward in saying to some of our friends from, you know, regulators, politicians and some other industries, stop lecturing us. You know, we've been striving hard to make it possible for everyone, every digital player to have access to all repertoires. Yeah. Today, any consumer can have access for free to millions of music works legally. So there is really no reason why today people should, you know, criticize uh, society or our industries. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Looking at the technology sector, uh, has the relationship with uh, uh, music startups, uh, um, how has it evolved and has it uh, uh, gone better, for example, in the last uh, three or four years? Uh, and of course, one of the homegrown examples in, in uh, uh, France is Deezer. So, so how, is, how has that relationship evolved for you? Um, first of all, I want to say that all these players, uh, whether they are Europeans or Americans, uh, they really are partners for us. You know, yeah. we had a few months of uh, tough negotiations with uh, our partners from YouTube, but we made a deal. And uh, I mean, we had all this discussion in, in good faith and the goal was to have a deal. Um, I was in, in, in LA and in San Francisco in Mountain View uh, uh, two months ago, and I spent hours with key players of the industry, newcomers also, you know, from, from Grace Notes to YouTube and from Google to uh, Zephyr, which is a, a very dynamic uh, startup that was created to uh, manage rights online and I'm impressed of course by by this uh, dynamism but I'm almost more impressed by the fact that in Europe where we don't have the key players like you know Apple or Amazon or, or Google 
the only worldwide class digital player we have are Spotify and Deezer. And this is a lesson to be learned by Europeans, yeah. which is that the fate of the digital industry in Europe rely on the content industry. And we should be proud of that, which is not often the case in Europe, you know. <laughs> and this is also something we try myself and many of my colleagues to change, make the people understand what the reality is, which is that we, I mean, we, the content industries in Europe, we are part of the solution, not part of the problem. Yeah, sure. And uh, finally, uh, the uh, GRD project, the Global Virtual Database project, is kicking off in earnest uh, this year. And, you know, they're going to start setting up uh, actual offices and hopefully it's going to start bearing some results uh, by 2015 or so. So are you optimistic about the project and, and uh, do you feel like it's a necessary step for the industry to take? Oh, definitely. I hope uh, it will be a success uh, because uh, the industry needs to find um, new solutions to improve the way we manage data altogether, and as you know, the GRD was established for that, and the same has been at the origin with some of our colleagues uh, in pushing hard with uh, publishers, digital service providers, and also creators uh, to make this project uh, start. When it comes to what will it be, you know, I started my career with uh, uh, Anderson Consulting, you know, now with Accenture, so I tend to be always very cautious on big IT projects. Yeah. But so far, um, I guess we are on tracks. Yeah, that's great. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time, and have a great rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Great. I'm here at the World Creator Summit with uh, Paul Williams, ASCAP president and chairman, as well as being one of the most acclaimed songwriters in the US and a member of the Songwriters Hall of Fame. So hi, Paul, and it's uh, really great to have you here. It's good to be here. Thank you. Great. So first of all, I wanted to, to uh, talk about when you started out as a songwriter. You know, how important was it uh, to find out about societies and about ASCAP? You know, it's amazing. You can be protected by things you don't know anything about. <laughs> it was wonderful because I was an out-of-work actor. I, was an, I, I, I played little kids in movies, but I couldn't make a living at it. And I began to write songs for my own amusement. They began just as songs for my own amusement. All of a sudden, I, had, I, I met with a publisher you know, I had something recorded, and, I'll, and, I, and that quickly I was in the middle of the music business and didn't know anything about it. But fortunately, I had a good publisher. I'm a great believer in strong and, and, and involved publishing. Yeah. And a good publisher said, you know, you, you, you know we need to get you in, in, to, to join a, a performing rights organization. I started out with BMI very, for a few, few years and, and uh, had a first couple hits at BMI and then chose to, to move over to ASCAP. It felt like a little better fit, although I have great respect for the writers of BMI and, and some co-writers there sure. and if some songs that are still there. It's incredibly important because I don't have the capacity to run around the country while I'm writing songs and listen to all the, the clubs and see who's you know who's singing my music yeah, who's performing my songs I need somebody to represent me and blanket licensing is a brilliant idea that has worked for many years yeah and you we're talking about being protected by something you didn't know anything about so uh, how, how do you feel um, uh, young artists are uh, educated uh, when it comes to, to these uh, sort of matters and are they paying attention to making sure they're registered and, and everything else they are paid, they're paying attention but they're also being largely misinformed about copyright and one of the things that I that that we're trying to do at ASCAP is make sure that you know that we're very active in, in in educating young writers to where they really see the value of copyright. They see that you know that that their future, you know, really depends. And the, you know, if you get lucky enough to have one of those lovely little pieces of of music come out of you or a bit of a lyric that the world responds to, and you have that heart connection, yeah. because ultimately that's what it is. It's ultimately me listening to a, to a, a song by Rogers and, and Hart or 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 the Beatles or, or uh, Stephen Stills and going, oh, he's writing about what I feel. But you, ha you have that connection, you know. You get lucky enough to make that connection where all of a sudden your music is a part of people's lives yeah. and continues, you know. I wrote We've Only Just Begun in 1970. We've Only Just Begun is still being played, thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> once in a while. Goodness, and and it's, it's so wonderful to know that that can become an annuity for my family, that my children and my children's children, you know, can, uh, you know, can, can enjoy the, the fruits of my labor. Yeah. 
you know, we're talking about uncertainty in, in the great keynote sp speech you gave earlier and so uh, uncertainty for the creators of course uh, because of, of the current climate but also the fact that you know the positive on the positive side the fact that creators are still creating and they really want to create and you know that's that's yeah. what makes it great and so talking about that uh, you also made a remarks about uh, how uh, you know, people are not really talking straight when it comes to uh, copyright infringement and and the issues around that. So, w what is your stance on on that front of things, and and how perhaps uh, there should be more done to protect creators uh, in this country as well? You know, the at, at at every whenever any new platform for delivering music is is created, ASCAP and and uh, you know has has had to step up to the plate and say that this is a performance. Yeah. You know, and we deserve to be properly paid for it. And we've been able to work out a, a viable working relationship with with club first with 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 you know, music performed live, then in the moving into radio, television, cable, satellite. At at every level, we've been able to find a balance that is that is probably you know a great deal is one that we both walk away from going yeah. And we're looking for that kind of a deal in the digital world right now. The real challenge right now is streaming because, you know, it, and, and I am a huge fan of, of, of the technology. I love the fact, my wife is always screaming at me, stop staring at your hand because I've always got my, you know, my face in that iPhone yeah. because everything I need to know about the world is right there. But the fact is, it, when your music, you know, when when your films, you know, when when the entertainment of, of your life is provided in a streaming fashion like that, unless the creators of that of that entertainment are properly paid, the 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 desire or the ability to continue to working, uh, making music, making movies is going to disappear. And and it ultimately writing songs, you know, is is going to become a hobby as opposed to a profession. Bill Withers had the you know the wonderful songwriter Bill Withers was in Washington D.C. with 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 me. We were visiting a senator talking about about copyright, and Bill Withers had one of the great lines of all times. He said, "You know, Senator, you know, if if we can't make a decent living, you know, from from our our music online." We're going to have to do something else for you. We're going to have to get day jobs. And Senator, you do not want Ozzy Osbourne as your plumber. You know, so <laughs> the, it's, I think that's a bumper sticker. And I think that's what we have to do is when you think about the young, the young music creator, the young songwriter or composer that's beginning their career right now, for them to have a life and for them to be able to, 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 to devote their life to making music, we're going to have to adjust the the way the uh, the way that we are paid and the amount that we are paid. Yeah, yeah sure. It's fair. Absolutely, yeah. it's fair. And uh, talking about uh, the other great relationship that the songwriters have, uh, you know, in their lives, which is you know, on the one side the, pu the publishers and, and the other side the collection society. So, uh, as far as pub as publishing, you know, how how do you see the industry uh, shifting and uh, adapting to the new technology as well? Well, I'm a, as I said, I think at the beginning of, the, of our, our talk that I'm a great fan of great publishing. You know, yes. we I sit at, at as president and chairman of the board of ASCAP. I sit before a board that is the equally divided of publishers and writers. The passionate uh, involvement in the world of, of of copyright and protecting rights is is a challenge is equally met by publishers and and by writers at this point. I think that. That publishing is is for for many of us is something that we as writers we start out as strictly writers we you know as the years passed I became more and more actively involved in my own publishing, but you know I not only got the business you know the the the, the business rewards from having a good publisher, but I also got the creative rewards. I had a, a publisher named Chuck K who would say to me you know the say that's a, a beginnings of a great song but it's not done, that second verse needs work. Uh, I love that. I love the involvement of a, of a good publisher in that fashion at all. I think that, that the world is, uh, the, our, our world, our, our business world is offering some really interesting challenges right now and, and the larger your team may be the better. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And looking at uh, the relationship between uh, ASCAP and uh, you know, its counterparts in the US and also organizations uh, around the world, uh, do you feel like there is a, a cohesive sort of uh, uh, coming together of all these societies to make sure that all the money is pulled together and, and properly accounted for and that, and that you have a good relationship with everybody else around the world? We are, we, there is not, there's never been a moment of tension between ASCAP and any of the other <laughs> PROs around the world. You know what, I, I think that, that we're entering into a time right now where more than ever you're seeing people link arms. And, uh, you know, there was a period when 
individual interests were, you know, were a little intense around uh, all the elements of the, of the music business. I think we're at a place right now where, especially amongst the PROs of the world, we realize we have a we have common, you know, common challenges and common opportunities. You know, so CISAC is 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 in fact by its very essence is about you know embracing the fact that we're in this thing together and working together to make sure that that nothing stops the music. So my friends at Imro and and and. Uh, and APRA and and uh, CSM and around around the world uh, there are there are uh, there are great friendships and uh, and great working relationships you know and the fact is when my music is being you know my my music is being being played right now in in Paris and thank you uh, Jean Noël uh, for collecting my money and making sure that as a songwriter uh, that will translate to gas in the car to get me over to visit my kids yeah yeah sure and uh I wanted to end by asking you about uh, your uh, collaboration with uh, Daft Punk. Uh, of course, it's a uh, it's a number one uh, hit uh, around the world. Really, like the momentum is, is built incredibly. And it, I just wanted to ask you: you know, you're, you've contributed to two of the tracks on the album, and uh, how, how does it feel to be part of a mega? streaming hit which is really like one of the first uh, yeah. uh, truly global uh, streaming phenomena as well as being of course a, a fantastic seller in terms of actual uh, albums well you know daft punk evidently became aware of me through a movie called phantom of the paradise you know which which they claim to have seen about 20 times but four years ago they played two beautiful pieces of music for me and asked me if i'd write lyrics we talked about a concept of the album and the like and then after i after i wrote the two songs they asked about I would sing one of them. I put a, a vocal on a track. They disappeared and returned with this stunning album. And to see the, the, the you know, the, the fact that they've kind of gone back in time and forward in time at the same, yeah. the same fashion, the album is really, the album's like time travel for me because it begins with this sort of Stevie Wonder-esque sort of great rhythms and all from the 70s, which, which inspired these great memories of that kind of music. But then, you know, it's, you know, there was a great scene at the end of Space Odyssey where, where Kier Delea sees himself as an older man and then he becomes that older man and sees himself as an older man. That's what working on this album was like for me in a way. Uh, we worked together at A&M Records, which is where I, which is now Henson Studios. So I'm in a physical location where I used to write 30 years ago or 20 years ago, I'm now working with Daft Punk, I've become a, a huge fan of, of their music. And, and they've taken EDM, they've taken the electronic dance music. And I think while they haven't walked away from that, they've, they've introduced their audience to what, uh, to, uh, to Giorgio Moroder, to Paul Williams, to some interesting music from the past. They are the opposite of ageist. For me at age 72, to be a, a, an active participant in a number one album uh, of this type is a great gift. Yeah, it's awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time and I hope you have a great rest of the day. I appreciate it, my friend. Thank you. Uh, great, so I'm here at the World Creators Summit uh, with Ralph uh, Pierre, the CEO of uh, Pierre Music. So, Ralph, it's great to have you on. How's it going today? It's a great, it's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, great, so let's, uh, let's start by talking about the, the legacy of Pierre Music. So, it's a company that uh, started out in uh, 1928 uh, and uh, uh, is, is going strong to this day. So, uh, what is your secret to, to keep a healthy uh, publishing company uh, running for such a long time? Well, I think it's very import important to bar balance the privilege of having a uh, a wonderful heritage catalog uh, with the ability to be flexible and to move quickly to provide services in the modern world and uh, the two uh, do mesh in uh, many instances and uh, we're able to uh, to keep our heritage catalog fresh because we have a lot of younger people and executives who are very much involved in the contemporary market uh, who understand that that heritage catalog is very important to them. So they can view it from a modern point of view and, uh, and work with updating it, with making sure it gets out there for synchronizations along with today's current hits, which is what everyone is always looking for until they remember there's something else that they might use. Uh, so uh, I've been very fortunate that uh, we've had uh, wonderful executives uh, along the way, which I, who I've encouraged to make this blend of keeping in the contemporary market and to uh, remember the uh, 
the songs from years gone by that are so important to us. Yeah, sure. And it's, it's all a question of making sure that the catalog that you have doesn't sit there idly and, and it, is, it is actually used uh, f for the new generations and uh, in, if anything, in the long tail of, 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 of the business, but it still brings in money. So. Well, we make a, a, a very proactive undertaking right. to so. bring that catalog material along because they're proven songs. Yeah. And if you go out today to get a proven song on the market, and that you're working with uh, with new material, yeah. you don't have that assurance that it's going to be as successful uh, as as these that have already passed the, the test, if you will, the test of time. Yeah. Yeah. And um, for instance, uh, songs that everyone recognizes, like "You Are My Sunshine," we're, we're very very active in getting them into ringtones uh, and uh, various uh, new media usages, <coughs> because if a new generation hears that music. It's going to be acceptable to them in the in the sense that they're already uh, wonderful songs, and uh, they'll they'll wear it in their consciousness as they do with contemporary material. Yeah. So it's very on the other side of that coin. It's very important that we remain active in the contemporary market, and uh, we uh, we invest our efforts in doing so. Sure. And looking at the technology sector, of course. Um, because uh, a lot of the talks that are, are, are here, you know, are revolving around the, the friction that still exists between the uh, technology sector and, and the creative cre creative industries. And uh, uh, looking at your perspective from a publisher's point of view, uh, when the technology companies started working in music and music startups starting operating, there was a lot of focus on, of course, getting the, the deals for the master recordings and perhaps publishing was, uh, you know, the, the awareness of how, what publishing was and how publishing worked for these companies came a little bit later. So how, how are you finding this, this market is evolving for you, for you guys uh, from a, a new technologist's perspective? Well, in terms of the new markets, I think you're aware that we were a, an angel investor in eMusic, which was one of the first platforms that gained any significant traction yes. in terms of uh, selling uh, pure digital play uh, with uh, downloads over the internet. And we had this strange model of selling a la carte tracks at 99 cents a piece, which has a resonance in years, in years later. Uh, and uh, I can tell you, probably because I was there, publishing figured early on the game as, as to how rights were paid for. Uh, at that time, the major labels felt that they were going to take advantage of the new uh, realities, the new digital landscape, to control the music from what I would call the cradle of the grave, from production right through the distribution in, in the digital mode. And they were disintermediating the other uh, uh, the other sellers of, uh, of digital product yeah. in the process. A little bit like how travel agencies have felt with the online availability of tickets. Uh, and uh, this was, frankly, it was unhealthy uh, because they wouldn't license to us, they wouldn't license to any uh, upcoming uh, platform. So there, there was no platform at the time that encompassed the full range of music. I think at eMusic we had upwards of 85% of the independent uh, material available in the United States, important acts like Fish and so forth, um, and, uh, and, and we did well with what we had. But there was no place, no legitimate place, that the uh, buyer could go to get the uh, full range of, of masters. Yeah. And uh, frankly, I think that was a reason why an abster got so much traction, because that's very inconvenient to the consumer. So I felt the model was very good, and we had a payment structure in place that everyone was happy with. Uh, but it, uh, it, it, when along came Napster, it was very difficult for us. And as you know, that took several years in litigation. We were a plaintiff as pure music in the case because we, of course, weren't being paid, and we felt we, we and our composers ought to be paid for the uses. But my view of Napster is is not so much the hundreds of millions, maybe more, uh, of dollars that were lost uh, to the licensing community, to the to the rights holders, to the creators, but more what it did for the uh, for the point of view of the uh, next generation, that the marginal value of a cop a digital copy of a song was nil. And uh, it really created a value pricing scenario. You know, that term is, is when you put, when you value an item by its price. A, a quarter ounce of uh, Chanel Number no. 5 cologne or uh, perfume is not going to really be worth 100 euros, but that's what people pay for it because of the image it's created. Well, we had the same issue, I think, with music, except it was the other end of the spectrum. The value that was associated was nil. 
And that was a most, uh, most unfortunate occurrence because up until that time, well, there might have been a few complaints, but most people in the tangible world did not feel music was overpriced for what you got. And it was not a complaint we had a lot. So I think that was really the greatest impact of the, of the online world. Uh, recovering from that has been long and hard, and, and I hope it's going in the right direction. When you say there's friction between the two, I'm not quite sure that's accurate, other than the normal frictions that would be addressed between a, a buyer and seller of, of almost any price, uh, almost any item, uh, be it tangible or intangible. Their, their pricing discussions are what's really going on, and uh, those are um, particularly difficult. Uh, in uh, when new mu music uh, business models uh, flourish or come to come to fruition anyway every day and you're looking for a, a fair licensing approach to that and you consider all the possible downsides and when you're in our position as a content owner and uh, and it it means we're particularly cautious about issuing those licenses which is probably not a good thing but hard to get over Sure. And you're also vice president of the NMPA, and and co copyright, of course, is uh, what you know brings us all here, and what what gets this industry uh, working and and produces uh, the you know the value that that the societies and the publishers can can then get out of the music. So uh, one of the key issues at the summit was the fact that in the U.S. Uh, there might be a review of of the copyright, uh, which uh, might. Uh, as it was illustrated, it'd be done step by step instead of uh, just taking a view of, of the whole thing because that would take far too long. And uh, and do you think that uh, there there are dangers? Because of course, uh, when we talk about bills, uh, there's always a danger that just a change in language, a change in a comma, or something like that would uh, alter the way in which your rights can be exploited. Do you think uh, uh, it's feasible to to foresee a, a positive outcome to this to this review if all the parties come together in a, in a sort of positive manner? Well, I think it's unlikely the parties are going to come together in a positive manner, uh, because well, because the the forces that be that are, uh, are encouraging this copyright review uh, have a very definite viewpoint that protection of intellectual property per se is inappropriate for the modern economy, and I personally think that's both short sighted and, and foolish because if you don't value a creator's output. Uh, at uh, something real, uh, you are saying something about the way creators are handled or treated within a society. And I like to think that our society is very much enrich enriched by the fact that uh, over years uh, creators have been encouraged and uh, through, uh, through commercial terms. Because although there certainly are some creators that create for the sake of creation, for the sake of beauty, if you will, and I have every respect for that. The fact of the matter is that if you can't concentrate on your art uh, and you really are doing a number of other things in order to sustain your livelihood, you're not going to uh, be able to hone it to a place where the public finds it acceptable, where you're able to do new things uh, with it. Uh, and it's a great loss for society when that happens. And I think those are the two issues that are at play in revamping copyright. There are a number of smaller issues uh, on which I think we will uh, be able to find common ground, uh, such matters as orphan rights, for instance. It's a very good point. Uh, and the reason it becomes a point, and, and that point being, of course, that there are works you can't identify, how do you license them? and we need to come up with a process whereby that can happen, is that for the first time with the, uh, the digital um, economy, we're able to provide an opportunity for those works to get to the public. It was very rare indeed that a work that had no uh, commercial potential and was therefore because it had been lost or is lost because it never had commercial potential, that those works would be of, of, of interest or use, even even in scholarly areas where they didn't have to pay copyright anyway. So that's being driven by that. I think it's good that there's this interest in a, in a wider range of music. Uh, and uh, I think we need to come up with a solution for it. So there's an example of a sidebar 
which probably will be able to be saved uh, and, and presented as useful to all parties. Yeah, well, with positive development, sure. And uh, uh, looking at the at the international scene, and uh, you know, of course, we have societies from from all over the world. Uh, how are your relationships with? Uh, uh, services that are outside of the U.S. and you have a lot of dealings with, uh, uh, for example, either startups or new digital services that come from uh, uh, countries other than Europe and, and North America. Well, to answer your first question, uh, Peer Music uh, operates in uh, 27 countries and we have uh, relationships with societies in, in all those territories in a number of places. Uh, our executives have participated at a board level in those societies and work with the composers and the management of the societies. Uh, so we have a, a very strong relationships with them. As I said in my panel this morning, we certainly find that some societies are better at providing value uh, than others are. But uh, it's a range uh, of propositions, and uh, we'd like to work with those societies that we don't find are that helpful to to bring them more to an area where they're really uh, doing their job on behalf of creators worldwide. One of the aspects you have with an international society system is that uh, many of the uh, many of the uh, works being represented by any given society actually come from authors and publishers who are in different countries, and those people do not have uh, immediate representation on the boards of the local societies. So we uh, and other international publishers find ourselves always thinking about that element uh, of what the society is doing and uh, sometimes people have to be reminded that they, it's their privilege to represent these people sure. and they have a duty towards them. And finally, what is your impression on uh, the summit itself? Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting place to be because it brings together creators from all over the world and, and uh, societies that represent creators from all over the world. And uh, is it your first time here? And if not, it, how have you seen the event evolve? Well, I've been present at uh, Congresses sponsored by SISAC for many years. And they're always interesting for exactly the reasons you mentioned, that you have the viewpoints from individuals from uh, all over the world. Uh, I think this particular summit in Washington uh, is uh, is more interesting than many I've attended simply because the new business models are coming to the fore and at the same time we have a little perspective of time of the difficulties uh, in the digital environment uh, of, of licensing and, uh, and handling uh, so many additional transactions and so many different types of licensing requirements. That's great. Well, thanks so much for your time and have a great rest of the day. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Great. So I'm here uh, at the World Creators Summit and we're going to have a bit of a discussion about the uh, Global Repertoire Database or GRD. So uh, first of all, uh, we've got uh, FX uh, Nuttall, who is Product Specialist uh, at uh, YouTube uh, uh, slash Google, of course. Yeah. And uh, then uh, we have uh, uh, Niels uh, Mosmugard, uh, who is uh, uh, Vice Chair at the Danish uh, Songwriters Guild. So hi guys and thanks for joining me. How's it going? Hey, super. Hey, thanks. Super, yeah. Great, awesome. So, uh, so first of all, let's talk about uh, the importance of the GRD. The project is kicking off in earnest. You know, it's been in the works for quite some time, but now, you know, quite recently they announced uh, that they're going to open some offices, and so it's the, the thing is really starting to kick into gear. So, uh, first of all, uh, FX, uh, what's your take on the GRD, and why is it important for uh, somebody like YouTube? Uh, so without a joke, it's really music to our ears to have the GRD. Uh, we are very dependent on the data to be able to monetize the content for the benefit of the creators. So we need to f identify who owns what. And we're talking about 5 million works worldwide on uh, about 100 territories. And so it's a lot of data and a lot of resources to actually identify rights holders. So when the GRD comes in, uh, which will be this database where we can identify the publishing and, and the author's rights, uh, we couldn't go there and clearly identify where to go for a license. Yeah. And this will change our business completely. Yeah. And Niels, uh, from your perspective, as sort of representative of the, of the creators community, what's your take on the GRD and why do you think it's important? Well, I think it's important of, of many reasons, actually. Mainly because we have this uh, merging of, of, of data, uh, the publishers and the scientists, as FX is, is telling about. So we, we, we have this authoritative uh, bank of data. Uh, one thing, it's very important in a multi-territorial licensing world. 
and then I think it's it's very important and a, a very productive thing that we, that we meet the creators meet with the licenses, with the societies, with the publishers, yeah. being in the same room, having to make consensus about the the problems we have, instead of pointing to each other and say, well, I mean, he's he's well, walking down like he's walking down the down the street, but I wouldn't talk to him. Yeah. Now we have to meet and and have serious discussions. One must say yeah. that, yeah. Uh, absolutely. But but you know, with with this end of the requirement and and design phase that we are signing off in two weeks or something like that. Uh, we have we have uh, yeah made some agreements. Uh, this is how we think it should look like right now. Yeah. Let's move forward with this. Yeah. Like, let's try to build it, and uh, when we start working with it, let's see if it's the right way. Is there really something we, we need to change? Yeah. So two very you know, different things, but but I think they're very important. Okay. Uh, and so, in terms of the history of the project, so when when do you first uh, hear about this, and and how long have, have you been involved? So it's been a couple of months now. So the project has been active for a year and a half, two years maybe, since its very early stage of yeah. of concept conceptualization, um, and we've been deeply involved in that recent phase that lasted about six months, yeah. where um, thankfully the the licensees that I represent here were invited to actually, you know, provide some input and understand the requirements that we have. Uh, and so the publishers and societies uh, could take our needs uh, and integrate them into the project. So it's been very, very helpful yeah. uh, for us to really be able to participate. Yeah, sure. And uh, from your perspective, you know, how long uh, have you been involved? And do you think, uh, you know, how, how do you see the project shaping up uh, for, the, for the future as well? Well, I've been involved since October last year. Uh, I'm, I'm a representative of, of EXA, the European Composers and Songwriters Alliance. Uh, and well, I heard about GID in the very beginning. Uh, someone from the working group of the parliament uh, visited our, our meeting at EXA yeah. and told us about it. And, and uh, yeah. we all were very suspicious. Oh, I was very suspicious <laughs> because it seems so huge and, and uh, unrealistic in, in some ways. And, and, and we had those looking at it and, and it, hey, it looked like the publishers, the majors would be there and oh, they would take all the, the benefits. And uh, so, but, but, but during the, the two years, I think it has been progressing, I, it, it sort of changed. Uh, and in October, uh, the exit people asked me if I would go uh, to have a seat there. And uh, I, I think it's been very interesting and, and very good. Yeah. And it feels like the, the timing as well has, has been right, because the, maybe the, when it started, the problem wasn't quite as acute as it is now and uh, you know in the past two years uh, more and more uh, we feel the need of a database of this kind and you were talking about you know the sort of matching and then some of the numbers that that youtube does and it's it's insane yeah it, it is insane <laughs> look at it uh, from a certain perspective but um what really triggered the whole need is the implementation of the pan-European licenses, or what I should call the multi-territorial licensing. Yeah. So we are exactly at a turning point in the licensing, at least in Europe, but it's growing worldwide, where uh, major rights holders are now providing licenses on a multi-territorial basis. Yeah. And this uh, impacted on the fact that we need to identify the repertoire that is being licensed. Yeah. So when a publisher tells us, okay, you can have my repertoire, then we, okay, which repertoire? You know, what are these works that are being licensed? And this is where the GRD comes in to provide us with this authoritative information that we actually really need now. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, looking at uh, the GRD as a project that was really started in Europe, uh, what is the, how do you feel the, the involvement of the community worldwide is at the moment? Well, we have made the decisions about location, and, and, and it's sort of Eurocentralized. Uh, the headquarter in London, the the first operational center in Berlin, but but obviously, it, 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 the plan is to, to make it twenty four seven. So we need the Asian market is a completely different market. So you need the expertise 
uh, of the Asian market going to Japan or, or somewhere like that, and it's to, to the United States as well. As well. Yeah, sure. I mean, there are operational centers everywhere. And for for you, for the, in terms of collection societies, uh, do, do, do you feel like uh, it's 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 good for you guys to be in the same room with all the collection societies and all the all, all those stakeholders and and discuss things uh, in a, in in a sort of uh, uh, in a problem focused manner, which I guess uh, uh, encourages relationships as well. <laughs> yeah, problem focused or solution focused, solution maybe. Focus, yeah, yeah. Um, no, they are major partners for us. Societies and, and publishers are really the, the key players uh, helping uh, YouTube and Google deploy its, its products. So it's definitely needed. Um, and we appreciate the, the internationalization of the project. So right now, it, it is like most European centric because this is where the, the need is urgent. Yeah. But the scope of the GRD is to integrate uh, Latin American repertoire, Northern American, Asian, African. So it's really very broad in focus, but yeah. it's going to come in stages. So we're going to start with the European, as I said, the, the most urgent need. But we're looking forward to have the other more exotic uh, on a US perspective uh, repertoire available also. Sure. Well, that's great. Thanks so much for your time. And uh, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens in the next uh, year and a half, two years, and see whether in 2015 we're going to see the database uh, come out uh, into existence. Definitely. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Great, so I'm here with uh, Matt Mason, uh, who is the uh, Vice President of Marketing at BitTorrent uh, at the World Creator Summit. So, hi, Matt, and thanks for joining me. How's it going? It's going well. Thanks for having me. Great. So, uh, you know, first of all, I want to start talking about uh, BitTorrent's uh, efforts in the past, you know, uh, couple of years to really become a partner of creators. So you've uh, you've tried to fight the image that the creative industries had of BitTorrent as a company that uh, promoted piracy and the associations that came with that. And so, where are you in this road to become a partner of the creative in creative industries, and where do you want to get? Yeah, it's a good question, and you know it's interesting because if you lo actually look at the history of BitTorrent, the company, um, BitTorrent's always been a partner of the creative industries, and BitTorrent has never ever endorsed piracy. I mean, if if you go back, BitTorrent's been one of the largest licensees of Hollywood content in, in the world, other than Netflix. Um, in, in terms of where we're at today, um, we're working with all of the major record labels. We're talking to all of the studios about how we can help them and how the BitTorrent protocol and the existing BitTorrent ecosystem can both be used to add value to the, the business of creating a sustainable future for content. Yeah, yeah. And one of the initiatives that you know has been talked about recently has been that of the BitTorrent bundles. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's something that you launched that allows creators to uh, present a, a bundle of different types of media. It can be anything really, and uh, you know part of that is uh, gated so that the, uh, the artist or the creator can add any sort of level of un unlocking level. So it can be an email, it can be a payment, it can be whatever they they choose essentially. And this started with uh, the artist Cascade uh, with uh, in partnership with the label Ultra, uh, and so. I wanted to ask you, uh, we're almost a month after the release of this bundle, do you have any uh, figures or, or sort of perspectives on, on how this, uh, this uh, first experiment has, has been going? Yeah, I mean overall the experiment's gone extraordinarily well. Um, some of the guys from Ultra are meeting with some of the guys from BitTorrent in San Francisco today to sort of go over the sort of month's results and we're going to be releasing those really, really shortly but it, in a nutshell it, it went really, really well and, and the one thing we've seen sort of over and over again with these experiments is that our users are, are real fans and they will reward creators for, for their efforts. It, it's just been a matter of figuring out, well, how do, we, how do we make a solution that works for both consumers and producers that, that uses the BitTorrent protocol? And that, that's the thing that's taken a long time to figure out. But it feels, like we're, it feels like we're getting there. It's still very much in the experimental stage. We're not going to have the full publishing platform for anybody to make a bundle out until end of this year. Um, but the early early experiments and the early prototypes have, have been very encouraging. You know, we're learning as we go, and it's been a, a real a real honor and pleasure to work with artists like Cascade. To you know, have got huge fan bases, so we can really you know road test the concept. Absolutely. Yeah. And do you plan on taking this as a campaign by campaign basis project, and then maybe eventually opening up to the, to to a wider base? Yes, exactly. So so what we're doing over the course of the next nine months is testing different types of gates inside the bundle just to see what works what's the best thing to do, What what's going to work for a DJ like Cascade, what's going to work for a band, what's going to work for a filmmaker, an author, how can we how can we experiment? And, and we're always surprised by what artists want to do and, and how they think about monetizing their work and how sometimes th they think about just releasing work to, in, to encourage some kind of social action. That's something we're seeing as well. Some of the 
the the world's most famous artists have reached out to us in recent months just said I want to use a bundle just to get people to do something nice for each other or to, to make some art with me. Like we never saw those kind of things coming when we, we really sat down to design the bundle. So it's, I think it's going to be interesting as a way to monetize and leverage value from you, from your content, which is obviously the, the big problem. But I think, you know, that, one thing that's been said often, I think Clay Shirky said it, is the most interesting thing about technology isn't the technology, it's what people do with it next. And I'm really excited to see kind of the, the cultural value that bundles create when you you give artists the power to decide what a store should look like. And essentially, that's, a bundle is essentially a store baked into a piece of content that the artist controls. So we're really excited about, it's not about what we're going to do with these bundles, it's about what the rest of the world will do with them. Yeah. And uh, one of the aspects of BitTorrent that's quite interesting is the fact that it, it's actually a potential mean to really slash costs of distribution of, of digital content. And uh, uh, But uh, the majority of, of course, content creators, uh, even if they do a free a free campaign or anything like that, they still choose to go with the, with the different providers that perhaps cost them quite a bit of money uh, as well. So uh, what, what do you think you can do as a company to promote the way in which uh, artists can use BitTorrent uh, as a distribution mean? And because uh, it almost feels like right now it's still a little bit difficult yeah. to understand how you go about seeding something like that for somebody that is uh, mm. not uh, really versed in, in, in that area and so you're working towards more sort of front front end yeah. solutions for artists yeah I mean if you look at our products I mean they, they're not the easiest things in the world to use they're definitely not the easiest things in the world to use for uploading content as an artist and that's because we've always deliberately tried to make them not easy to use for piracy yeah. like we've never wanted to point to illegal content we've never wanted to endorse piracy we didn't want to make it easy for people to create like a seamless content experience um, because we we didn't we, we just wanted to stay away from from piracy completely now that we've got two million pieces of legal licensed content out there in the bits or an ecosystem now that we've we've delivered close to 200 million downloads in the last 12 months of legal licensed content from BitTorrent HQ in San Francisco. Now that we're seeing this critical mass of people who want to do this, we're, we're just working as fast as we can to build a product that will let people do this. And you're absolutely right, the, the real value of BitTorrent is, uh, we, we're really excited about the bundle concept, but the real value of BitTorrent is, this completely takes away costs. We've got products in the market like BitTorrent Sync, which is essentially a way to sync computers with unlimited amounts of data between all your different machines that doesn't have any cost, none of the backend costs associated with other storage and syncing services, because there's no cloud, there's just your computers. and Really, that's the value of BitTorrent as a technology. And you know, the way we look at it is, if you look at every disruptive te technology in history, from filmmaking technology, going all the way back to when Edison invented the record player, the most disruptive technologies have always been thought of as kind of things to be fearful of at first. And you know, it's really no surprise that the first ten years of BitTorrent was, oh, this is this is something scary. Actually, it's one of the most valuable technologies we've ever created and we're really excited about the, the new applications of BitTorrent that we're rolling out in the, in the next few years. Yeah. And uh, talking about uh, you know, f switching from the uh, artist and the distributor's perspective to the consumer's perspective, BitTorrent has also, um, you know, of course we're seeing a drop in numbers of people that are using uh, the P2P technology to uh, pirate, especially music, because there's so many services that are more convenient to, to do that sort of thing if, if you need to find you know, the, the artists that you love or find music that you want to listen to. And so how do you present BitTorrent now as a front-end solution for consumers to find legal content? And, and uh, what is the best way to curate the content that is out there, uh, as you, you talked, like huge numbers to present to people? Uh, BitTorrent as a, as a discovery platform as well. I don't know that we are seeing a drop in numbers. We're certainly not seeing a drop in numbers. Oh, I meant a, a drop in numbers of, of people that are using P2P for piracy uh, or yeah, for copyright infringement. I'm, I'm not totally convinced not that that's true. That, yeah. the, the latest reports I've seen have suggested that the, the entire ecosystem is growing and a smaller percentage of the, the worldwide traffic is right. BitTorrent, but it doesn't suggest that the, the network's actually still growing. Um, and, and whether or not it's all legal or illegal uses is, is really hard to actually ascertain because it's, it's distributed. Um, but in terms of you know, what we're doing to try and make things easier for people, it, it really gets back to what we're doing with bundles and sort of releasing tools that are much more than clients for browsing the protocol, but actually content managers for consuming good content. Um, we're doing everything in our power to point people towards good content. Um, we launched an ad network last year, and, and, and really the whole point of that was 
we want to point our users to good content and we we point enough of them to good content that the people games companies software companies creators of all kinds are actually paying us to point our users towards their content so th these users are really valuable and they are they are mainstream consumers but it's going to be it's going to take us probably the rest of this year before you start to see some more sort of you know consumer friendly very easy to use products because we didn't want to build those until we were sort of sure that the ecosystem was changing and the good news is that it, it, it really really is so yeah sure and uh, looking at finally uh, the way in which uh, fans relate to musicians uh, so what you're trying to build is also a way for musicians to establish a relationship with their fans mm -hmm. because of course the fans need to be hit multiple times and uh, and you know they need to feel like they're comfortable with the artist before they you know usually yeah. part any any money or you know actually buy something from the artist so where do you sit in that in that equation uh, would that be more for the for the uh, initial discovery phase or would it be for sort of a middle ground where the, uh, the fan is looking for stuff by the artist and they find it and they manage to get uh, an added value through through the, the bundles or through the torrent that the artist is seeing? You know what's interesting about all the experiments we've done in the last couple of years is what we, we really saw is that there's not a there's not a business model for digital content. There's not a one-size-fits-all solution that's just going to work for everybody. There's a different business model for every single piece of digital content in the world. And no one understands that better than the artist who created it and their fan base. So the idea of the bundle is we're going to give artists and creators the tools to configure a bundle that suits their business model. And if they make the majority of their money on iTunes, then the bundle will be a way to market and funnel people back to iTunes or if they make most of their money on YouTube you can funnel people towards YouTube if you want to monetize content directly you can do so in that bundle if you want to grab an email address from somebody and then market to them later and hit them multiple times you'll be able to do that as well our, our point of view our, our tagline is is options not rules and and we sort of look at the way the internet's evolving into a series of walled gardens where there's you know one business model in this walled garden and one business model here there's lots of really valuable platforms and stores and, and places that add value to content, but we don't believe in a one-size-fits-all solution. That's not that's not the way the internet works, and that's not the way creativity works. So what we're quite trying to create is something that can can really augment the rest of the the existing ecosystem, including including the bits around world, but also all of the great social platforms, streaming services, music stores, video websites, everything else that's out there. That's great. Well, thanks so much for your time, Matt, and have a great rest of uh, the conference. Thank you. And that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter.